I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, not a month goes by where I don't get a call at my institute by someone telling me that someone in the government implanted these things in their brain without them knowing. I'm not kidding. Now you may say, this doesn't concern me, or my children, or my community, but this is less and less true. Once we let the proverbial cat out of the bag, well, at that point, now we let loose science and technology in the broader public sphere. And this then gets us into the actually derivative social issues. We've advised the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon, which sounds very important. <laughs> the individuals, the groups, the politics and the societies that have the most sophisticated tools and perhaps weapons win. Out of disclosure, some of the work that I'm doing here today is funded by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. I'm also funded by the European Union Human Brain Project, specifically the Subproject 12, where I'm a task leader for dual-use brain science. And I've also done some ongoing work with the Strategic Multi-Level Assessment Crew over the past 10 years at the Pentagon, at Dr. Kabayan's group, and with DARPA. Military agenda is interested on the potential weaponization and misuse of brain sciences for nefarious agenda for political intelligence and military uses. I give you no science fiction in this lecture. I only give you science fact that may smell of something fictional or fantasy, but represents the reality of what we're capable of doing with the brain science. See, nanocells are real small, a thousand times smaller than these dust particulates. You inhale it, they go to work replicating, spreading like a virus, multiplying in exponentials. Six months' time, I could have a hundred million people converted, ditch diggers, porn stars, and presidents. Not one would be the wiser. A hundred million people will buy what I want them to buy and do pretty much damn well anything I figure they ought to do. I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, not a month goes by where I don't get a call at my institute by someone telling me that someone in the government implanted these things in their brain without them knowing. I'm not kidding. There are those that think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. The last sanctified space is that of my consciousness, and you're using this stuff to invade that? You're right. Technology has always brought man to the front of a new era. Old religions die and new religions are born. And now we all have arrived at a turning point in history. Folks, we are about to be plugged into the matrix for real. I'm not kidding. You can look around you and see it happening in real time. We have reached a new milestone where four billion people are now using the internet. Today, people want to kick out this reality and usher in a new reality. A world where you can be who you want, do what you want, to who you want, without the interference or consequence of morality or God. The movie The Matrix was just a tale of science fiction, yes, but it is beginning to look more like a documentary every day. Now some may scoff at this idea and say, you're just fear mongering, that's not going to happen, you conspiracy theory nut. Well, I may be a nut, but there is no conspiracy when the information is made public to you. That's just you not being aware of it. So we are going to take a closer look at this, because right now, something is happening that you may not be aware of. A sentient simulation of our world, in real time. No, this is not a video game, folks. But for those who think it is, I have a question. Are you ready, player one? What has gone from the drawing board to the reality is this the use of neural interfacing and physiological interfacing through the idea of remote controlled small scale systems to create a nano swarm of biopenetrable materials that you cannot see that can penetrate all but the most robust biochemical filters that are able to integrate themselves through a variety of membranes, mucous membranes in wherever, mouth, nose, ears, eyes, and they can be done in such a level that their presence is almost impossible to detect and as such, the attribution becomes exceedingly difficult to demonstrate. The idea here is to put minimal sized electrodes in a network within a brain through only minimal intervention to be able to read and write into the brain function in real time, remotely. A group of scientists say we are closer than ever to creating technology which can emerge with human biology in order to access the cloud in real time. Confused? Well, RT's Rachel Blevins is here and has all the details. 
Can you imagine technology that is so advanced it could provide you with instant access to the world's knowledge and artificial intelligence as soon as you think of a specific topic? According to a group of scientists, neural nanorobotics may be developed to enable a safe, secure, instantaneous, real-time interface between the human brain and both biological and non-biological computing systems. This level of technology could include brain-to-brain -brain interfaces, brain-to-computer interfaces, and specifically brain-to-cloud interfaces. Technology linking the brain to the cloud could drastically alter the state of communications between humans and machines. So in order for this to become possible, the study noted that data transfer between living human brains and the cloud would likely require the use of supercomputers with artificial intelligence algorithms. While they say that there are supercomputers with processing speeds fast enough to handle the necessary volumes of data right now, they still have to create tiny devices that would be embedded deep in the brain. I can create small robotic units, controllable robotic units at the nanoscale, and that these two can be aerosolized. The idea here is to put minimal sized electrodes in a network within a brain through only minimal intervention to be able to read and write into the brain function in real time, remotely. The senior author of the study noted that once inside the brain, the devices would then wirelessly transmit encoded information to and from a cloud-based supercomputer network for real-time brain state monitoring and data extraction. Such a breakthrough in technology has the power to transform communications, education, work, and the world as we know it. But with the requirement of tiny devices being inserted into your brain in order to access the cloud, it remains to be seen just how many people will be willing to participate. This is a very touchy area, but the disruptive effect can be huge. It can target key individuals and influence in ways that are kinetic and non-kinetic. The attitudes, beliefs, thoughts, emotions, activities, and relative vulnerabilities and predispositions of those individuals for whom may threaten us. It used to be that I need to be exceedingly close to someone to now influence them with a weapon. And now what we see is we create both distal potential as well as much more capable potential to affect them in a variety of different ways. A sentient being is simply a being that has feelings. So when you take that word and place it in front of the words world simulation, that should raise an eyebrow. Now creating a world simulation is not a new concept. Even a sentient one has been attempted over and over. For the public, these often came in the form of video games. The problem with these models is that they have to be constantly changed and upgraded. Every time there is a major event, new trend, or change in the real world. The sentient world simulation does this automatically. So what this is is a synthetic mirror of the world we live in. Not a piece of it, but the entire world. And this program constantly recalibrates the simulation based on real-time world events, trends, theories, economics, industry, almost everything you can think of that would contribute to an accurate model. Not to mention the individual pieces of data on every single person represented in the simulation. So to put this in perspective, what this is, is a digital clone of our world and everyone in it. Take a look. This is the front of my pen. This amount of nanomaterial, if be able to maintain and sustain with regard to its deliverability and aerosolization, could in fact affect all of you. And although it may not be that the sky is falling yet, folks, it looks like rain. Bring an umbrella. That said, what's going to rain down? This. The nanotechnology and the biotechnology filters down from the hydrosphere into the water supply and the food chain. And now every, every American, all 318 million Americans are, are infected. What do we do with the tools and techniques we have? What can we do and what should we do? Can we create designer brains? Are they targetable after birth? Are they modifiable throughout the lifespan? The answer to each one of these, ladies and gentlemen, is yes. I give you no science fiction in this lecture. I only give you science fact that may smell of something fictional or fantasy, but represents the reality of what we're capable of doing with the brain sciences. And what happens when we ultimately reverse engineer the brain and develop a machine 
that has cognitive capability and emotional capability. And before you go, oh, that's the stuff of science fiction. No, it's not. Actually, a system of computers, of conscious computers, with a will, intellect, and emotion of their own. Now, it's really not their own. It's the will, and it's the bio algorithms which make up the the bio algorithms which make up the will, intellect, and emotion of those that they've copied and destroyed. Can we handle the truth? Can we handle the answers? And even if we can, how are we going to handle it? Your brain is remotely tied. The cerebral cortex is remotely tied to a supercomputer for life, which monitors and manipulates all electromagnetic activity in the human's brain. A machine that has cognitive capability and emotional capability literally uses the first person singular I and tells us how it feels. A real, live, breathing, sensitive, and responsive entity, just like Pinocchio becomes a boy. If I stood before you three years ago and I told you this, I'd be like, here's science fiction that should start out with Once Upon a Time. Not science fiction anymore. Can we handle the truth? Can we handle the answers? You cannot compromise. You cannot negotiate. You cannot surrender to a computer. It will continue to do what it is programmed to do. Linking brains to machines and creating machine brains. Is that something we can handle? Mind transfer, mind copying, whole brain emulation, etc. For the purposes of training, research, and development. Stuff of science fiction? Nope. It's called the information and injection feedback loop. It's bidirectional, so they can upload, download, the speed of light. The system can, the supercomputer can. This information and injection feedback loop, this neural link between the victim's brain and the supercomputer. Linking brains to the internet and data clouds that make an unlimited amount of information available to us all the time. Yeah, we can do these kind of things. Pack number 6011991, remote brain computer interface, neural monitoring, i.e. via satellite, from the location of the individual to a remote location so that the brain activity can be computer analyzed. Uh, it, it, the system then takes those, those algorithms and, and, and correlates uh, communication and behavior data. When I say communication and behavior data, what I'm referring to is impulses and identifiers. Okay. Um, and then uh, that brain activity is then sampled, uh, remotely measured, and, and then integrated back into our new data um, uh, for the purposes of uh, you know, creating a cognitive model of the victim's brain. The ultimate aim would be to archive enough data on each individual to be able to make a computer model of everyone on the planet, one that could be used to predict the behaviors and reactions of every single person in the event of various scenarios. The set of models that make up the synthetic environment encompasses the behavior of individuals, organizations, institutions, infrastructures, and geographies while simultaneously capturing the trends emerging from the interaction among entities as well as between entities and the environment. I want to make this very clear. This is not a conspiracy theory. Your data is being collected. What data, you say? Your every activity, transaction, physical or virtual, communication, and yes, even your innermost personal thoughts will be cataloged and uploaded to a hive-based AI system on the global information grid. Yes, we can absolutely yoke brains to machines to create these interfaces. There's a brand new DARPA project that starts this month called NESD, Neural Engineering Systems Designs. The colloquial name for that is the cortical modem. Implants in the brain that allow real-time input and output from the brain remotely. The idea to then be able to take a key individual set of biological metrics and immediately in real time pull them into a large-scale data analytic to say, this is who this person is, and this is where this person's been, and this is who this person has been interacting with, could be very, very useful. The more we know, the bolder we go. Puts the brain at our fingertips. It also obviously opens the specter. It clearly opens a Pandora's box. Biological knowledge multiplied by computing power, multiplied by data, equals the ability to hack humans. And the AI revolution or crisis is not just AI, it's also bio biology, it's biotech. There is a lot of hype now around AI and computers, but just that the, it is just half the story. The other half is the, is the biological knowledge coming from 
brain science and, and, and biology. And once you link that to AI, what you get is the ability to hack humans. And maybe I'll explain what it means, the ability to hack humans, to create an algorithm that understands me better than I understand myself and can therefore manipulate me, enhance me, or replace me. And this is something that our philosophical baggage and all our belief in you know, human agency and free will and the customer is always right and the voter knows best, this, this just falls apart once you have this kind of ability. This is how it works. This program collects data. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing right now, this system is compiling data on you. And not just about where you are and what you are doing, but how you are feeling. Because after all, you cannot truly have an accurate simulation without factoring in real human emotion. I can see you and hear you. I can sense your environment and I can respond to your emotions. I guess you could say I'm putting a human face on artificial intelligence. Right now, there is a miniature digital version of you living, meaning in a sentient nature, in a synthetic digital environment. People, this is the Sims game from hell. Do you know that with this program I can throw you into a scenario where there is a catastrophe just to see how you react to it, essentially gaining the ability to predict your next move? Your brain reality is your reality. And if in fact I can import information into that brain and take outputs from that brain and link that to an avatar so that brain thinks that it's embodied and moving in the world and experiencing the world, can we do this? I have two words for you. Stephen Hawking. Yeah, we can do these kind of things. You can load anything from clothing to equipment, weapons, training simulations, anything we need. Right now, we're inside a computer program. Is it really so hard to believe? Your clothes are different, the plugs in your arms and head are gone. Your hair has changed. Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. This is the world that you know. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century. It exists now only as part of a neural interactive simulation that we call the matrix. You've been living in a dream world, Neo. This is the world as it exists today. You. I don't care if I live or die. I'm looking for someone. Don't do anything stupid, cousin. Man, I'm ready, Phoenix. I'm ready. Yeah. I don't want to die, man. Not like this. How would you like to die? We need to go bust somebody, man. I'm the one who survived. Grand Theft Auto 4, out now. Rated M for Mature.